Hi, I'm Mark Sechrist, Director of Training here at Couchbase. This is the first of a series of sessions that we're going to go into that are designed to provide a fast track or a study session designed to enable you to prepare for the Couchbase Associate Java Developer Certification, something that we've also announced here at the conference, and I'm pleased to make generally available to everyone. So the idea behind these sessions is to help you prepare for the certification by providing a lot of the background and fundamental information. So in this particular session, we're going to focus on getting started with the Couchbase Java SDK. And by that, I mean, we're going to focus specifically on how to configure your project, set it up so that your uh, Java project is able to make use of the Couchbase Java SDK. We'll talk about how to use the SDK, meaning how to get connected to the database, how to perform key value operations. And then we'll conclude this section with a discussion of how to handle errors and uh, discuss domain objects and how you can translate between Couchbase documents and domain objects uh, using serialization, deserialization techniques. All right, let's talk about setting up the Java project. Very first step. Now, um, before we begin, I wanted to spend a bit of time acknowledging that Couchbase provides a number of different SDKs for different languages, including Java, Scala, .NET, and so on. We'll focus here in this section on the Java SDK, but if you want to know more about any of the, uh, the SDKs and understand what are the latest versions and what are the latest features of those versions, you can go to this URL that we have here, and it kind of has an overview of all of the SDKs, and then you can use that homepage to then drill into the specific language that you're interested in and learn more. Now, with respect to the Java SDK, what are the ways in which you can access the SDK? The typical way would be using a dependency management system such as Maven, Gradle, Ant and Ivy, that sort of thing, or just simply downloading the jar file and um, getting access to it that way um, through a zip and, and, and so on. So um, we're going to focus primarily on the Maven and Gradle approach. Um, that's probably the most common way that you're going to use uh, you're going to get access to the SDK and add it to your project. Um, the other ways typically require a lot more project setup and really aren't the recommended way. We do support them, but obviously um, you really want to use dependency management. And we'll talk about why that is uh, when we get a little further into this. All right, so getting set up in a project is actually quite simple. If you're using Maven, we show here on the left the pom.xml file. In the pom.xml file, you're going to simply add that dependency, specify the group ID, the artifact ID, and the current version. If you want to know what the latest version of the SDK is, again, you can go back to that SDK page. Usually, uh, the SDK page, and specifically if you go to the release notes, there's typically an exact uh, copy of this little uh, dependency snippet, both for Maven and Gradle that cover the latest version. I'm showing you the version that was available at the time of this recording, which was 3.0.8. So that's what we'll focus on as we go through uh, the demo and show you some of the various aspects of using the SDK. So on the right, you can see the equivalent of using um, the Gradle dependency management using um, a configuration in the build.gradle. You can see a lot of the same elements, the um, basically the group ID, the artifact ID, and the version just represented in the way that Gradle um, configures it. All right, so what I wanna do is just do a quick demonstration to show you how easy it is to get set up in your project. So what I'm going to do here is we will bring up the, uh, the SDK, uh, we'll bring up the IDE, I should say, and uh, we are going to open the pom.xml. Now, before I do, I just want to open the project dependencies and you'll see basically uh, the setup of the project. And you can see already with the dependencies that we have, we have the typical Java dependencies, and then we have the dependencies that were pulled in for JUnit. We're using JUnit 4 here. So it's got the Jupyter dependencies and all those kinds of things. Um, uh, and then, uh, Sorry, I'm using JUnit 5. I said 4, but it's JUnit 5. Um, and it pulls in a number of dependencies uh, that are related, something called transitive dependencies. And I, I, I want to specifically highlight that because that's an interesting feature of most dependency management systems. So what we'll see here is if we add this dependency in, the dependency dependency being java-client. So that's going to be the client that's pulled in. But notice when we save this project that it's going to actually pull in the Java client 
It's going to also pull in the core IO, which is the core Couchbase um, kind of developer low level components, I would say, that that represent the kind of the communication components, the low level elements that um, that are part of the Couchbase SDK. We're going to focus on largely using the Java client, but the under under uh, the lower level pieces are going to be uh, referenced a couple of times as well. That's actually where you'll find things like um, except exception definitions and those sorts of things. So, you know, you may have to dip occasionally into those, um, those uh, APIs as well, depending on what you're doing. Now, the other interesting thing is two other dependencies that got pulled in are the reactor core and reactive streams. Those are part of the project reactor dependencies. Um, if you know anything about the Couchbase SDKs, um, they are they support both uh, what I'd call a imperative programming style as well as a reactive stream style. And so in order to support that, we um, the Couchbase SDK uh, 3.0 was refactored to run on top of Project Reactor. And so these are the dependencies that have to be pulled in in order to support the reactive streams components. All right, and that's it. So now we have those dependencies in, we can close that file, we can close our dependencies here, and let's just switch back to our, our presentation. All right, and this is what we saw earlier. Um, when you pull in the dependencies, you'll actually see the Java client, you'll see the core IO, reactor core, reactive streams, and so on. So those are the dependencies that come in. Again, that's part of what's called de transitive dependencies. So typically all you have to reference is the Java client dependency and the associated version. That, pro that project file has its own set of dependencies and through the transitive dependency mechanisms of most dependency management systems, they will bring in not only the the dependency you reference, but also the dependencies that that particular um, dependency relies on. And so they get pulled in transitively. And so you see a bunch of additional uh, projects, uh, jar files get pulled in. And that's really the reason why we would recommend using uh, any of the dependency management systems is to take advantage of those features. All right, now that we have the project set up, we've got the SDK configured, let's focus on getting connected. Now, in order to understand how to work with the SDK, it's important to understand the various key components that are part of the SDK. The two primary components that would be represented in the SDK are the cluster and the bucket. And if you think about it, that's basically how you would interact with the Couchbase database to begin with. So you would use the cluster for such things as getting connected, performing queries across various buckets, performing searches across buckets, analytics, and so on. So you're gonna use the cluster to get connected, and then you're gonna use the cluster to then get you associated to the appropriate bucket and then you're gonna interact with that bucket. Now, as of the uh, Couchbase 6.5 and above and the associated SDK 3.0 and above, we've introduced this idea of scopes and collections. So think of scopes and collections as ways of organizing data um, kind of within the master definition of a bucket. And if you know about kind of the bucket storage uh, features of Couchbase, you know that it's possible to store sort of heterogeneous types of documents in a bucket. And so scopes and collections can actually be ways to limit who can access what data or to organize data within your bucket um, into different document types and that sort of thing. So it can be really handy as an organizational construct. So if you look at the, uh, the way that this is laid out, you can see that the thing that you actually perform key value operations on is the collection. So the way this is organized is a bucket can have one or more scopes, scope can have one or more collections. And so that's typically how you will interact with all the components. So let's talk about how to use the cluster and bucket to actually get connected up to the database. Okay, so first of all, we have this class cluster. And so the main thing you're going to do on the cluster, the very first thing that you're going to do, I should say, is connect to the cluster. And how do you connect to the cluster? Well, you have to know where the cluster lives. You need to know the host that you're going to connect to. You need to know what username and password you're going to use to actually connect to the cluster, to the, to the, uh, to the actual Couchbase uh, uh, cluster. And then uh, if you're going to access any data in any buckets, then you need to make sure that you're, you're having a, a user that's been set up that is given permissions to access and perform uh, application operations 
uh, for the given bucket that you're intending to work with. So on the, on the Couchbase administration side, you would need to set up that user, assign the permissions to be able to access the bucket and so on. And then on the application side, you would use that username and password along with the host, and that's how you would get connected. So that's the simplest way to get connected. And in fact, that's the minimum that you have to provide. If you're interacting, if you're gonna get connected to the cluster at a very minimum, you need to provide the host, the username and the password to get connected. Now there is another um, overloaded method on the cluster. Uh, that's a connect method that allows you to provide cluster options and cluster options allows you to provide more information to the, to the connect request that would allow you to specify things like if you wanted to have a custom authenticator or some other features like that. There's a lot more that you can, you can do to actually take more control of the authentication process. In this case, in the examples we're going to show, we're just going to show a simple connection. You can see that the cluster.connect returns a cluster. So if you're able to successfully connect to the cluster, then what you get back is a reference to the cluster. So what can you do on a cluster? Well, the main thing you're going to do on a cluster is get a reference to a bucket. And so you have a bucket object that corresponds to the bucket in question. And you can see how that correlation works. We have a string defined as the bucket name. We pass that bucket name in and we say cluster.bucket and that gives us back the bucket for the name bucket. And now we have an object we can interact with. Now, the logical thing to think of is, okay, I have a bucket, buckets have documents, therefore I would perform my key value operations on the bucket. And ordinarily that would be true in an earlier versions of the SDK that was true. However, we're going to see that we need to add a couple of additional components to interact with. But before I leave this topic, I did want to mention that cluster and bucket are designed or intended to be objects that live as singletons within your application. So the typical use case would be early in your application lifecycle, you would probably create a cluster and a bucket object. And those would live for the life of your application. And then as your application um, is shutting down, then it would release those, those references and the resources would be released back. But rather than having this idea of connecting per session or per user, per request kind of a thing, we don't do that with the cluster and the bucket. Those are intended to be long-lived objects typically managed as a singleton somewhere in your application. Okay, so let's come back to the idea of collections and scopes. If you recall from our earlier visual here, we have a bucket. Within a bucket, we have scope, and within scope, we have a collection. And I mentioned that um, in this current version of uh, Couchbase, Couchbase 6.5 and 6.6, .6, that we currently don't support um, this idea of, uh, of named buckets or named collections or named scopes. That's a feature that will be enabled later. We expect that to be in, in a version, probably version 7.0, but, but currently that's not supported in production, uh, in a production uh, cluster. We have what's called developer preview, which would allow you to access those features now, but you have to kind of take your chances with the features. Not intended for production, but if you wanted to play around with those features, you certainly could in, in current versions. Um, we're gonna focus on how to use what's called the default scope and the default cluster. And actually the, the way that you would do that is actually quite simple. You don't even have to go and get a default scope. When you get a default collection, you actually get the default collection of the default scope. So it's not necessary to actually go to that level. So the workflow then, if you look at it, in being able to get connected and access the collection so that you can perform the operations is you connect to the cluster, now you have a reference to the cluster. With the cluster, you get a bucket by name that gives you a reference to the bucket. And with the bucket, you invoke the default collection method. And the default collection method gives you back a reference to a collection, which is the default collection, and that's what you'll interact with. And so that's basically kind of the workflow that you would go through. Okay, so um, just kind of wrapping up this section, uh, one of the things that you'll want to be aware of is, is that we have extensive Java documentation for all of the Java SDK components for 
uh, for the Couchbase SDK, the Java SDK in particular. Um, and the starting place to get access to all of this is at docs.couchbase.com slash Java dash SDK and so on. So this is kind of the starting point. And that'll actually talk you through kind of the documentation side of using the SDK. But on this homepage, there's actually references to other um, uh, material, including the reference guide, uh, which will give you a, uh, a reference to kind of a list of the latest version, what are the, the changes and enhancements of that version, as well as links to the, uh, the Java doc. And so that's where you get access to this page, which we're currently looking at the Java doc for uh, 3.0.7, happened to be the one that I grabbed for a screenshot. But as you may be familiar using Java development, um, typically you depend pretty heavily on having Java docs and looking at the Java docs to actually tell you the specifications of the various methods and so on. So I'm gonna give you an overview of some of the basic usage of the cluster, the bucket, the collection and so on, but realize that there's much more extensive documentation here that you can reference that would walk you through some of the more um, advanced and uh, detailed kind of usages that you may want to take advantage of with with respect to the SDK. So I wanted to point your attention to that because that's a really important uh, element that you typically want to have available um, all the time. All right, so before we get into the next step, I did want to uh, uh, add to the demonstration. So we're going to go back over to the, uh, to the IDE. We'll open up our empty application and I want to add the first couple of components to our application, which is to connect to the cluster and with the cluster, I wanna get a bucket. And so we see that uh, we have the basic connect and here rather than separating out the strings, all I've done is I've, I've hard coded the, uh, the references uh, to localhost, the user and the password. Now, obviously in order for this to work, you have to have a Couchbase cluster running, which I happen to have a database running, running on localhost and I've already established that there's a CB user user that's been defined with the password password. And that will grant me ability to interact and perform operations on the Couchmusic2 bucket. So um, let's go ahead and bring in those dependencies through the import statement. And now we have those set up. Now, the last thing that you would do is we would do something like uh, we, would, we would have a collection equals bucket dot default buck collection. And there you go. Now, of course, again, we have to import that reference to collection. So we'll do that. Now, of course, if you've used Java extensively, you're familiar with the fact that Java has its own notion of a collection and a collection there represents kind of the base class or the interface that's associated with uh, such data structures as lists, array lists, and you know, various things like that. So um, we wanna make sure that we're clear that what we're, we're importing is the reference to the Couchbase specific idea of a collection here. So in this case, we'll add this bring it in and we're all set to go. So now that we've done that, we'll save that, we'll run the application and we'll see that it basically starts up. One other thing we should actually do here, and it's typically something you always wanna do on the end of your application that I mentioned is um, when the application's shutting down, not only do you wanna release your, your references to the bucket and the collection, but we should actually disconnect from the cluster. So we'll have this, uh, cluster dot disconnect. So we'll disconnect from the cluster and that'll be the end of it. Okay, so that's the basic connection disconnection kind of process. So as we run that, you'll see that um, you should see a reference here that says we completed the shutdown, uh, all open buckets are closed. What you did not see is that we didn't see a reference that any buckets got uh, open. The reason for that is the process of actually getting the reference to the bucket and the collection is somewhat lazy. What we'll find is, is that we actually don't open the bucket until we perform an operation with respect to that. So when we get to that part, we'll actually see a bit more about how that works. All right, let's jump back to our uh, discussion of the various operations here. And we're going to focus on the key value operations or what we often call the CRUD or create read update operations. <clears throat> 
And here we have the basic rundown of the different create read update methods. So we start with kind of on the left hand side, we see that we have uh, the, the desired function and then the associated method that would be implemented or called on the collection to perform that operation. We also want to pay attention to the assumptions that may exist with respect to that method. So that's going to become important as we focus on uh, not only the operation we intend to perform, but what assumptions are we making and what happens if those assumptions turn out to be false. So um, the next thing I want to point you to is not only do we have the standard create, read, update, delete, but we also have a kind of an update or insert. Now, if you think about it, the way that this works is that on an insert, we have an assumption. If you're going to perform an insert, we assume that the document does not already exist. And what happens if it does exist? Some error would occur, basically. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get into the various operations. Similarly, there's a get, which would assume the document exists. So it basically says, for this given key, I want the object to be returned. Replace for this given key. I want to replace the existing value with the new value I'm providing. Again, we assume the document exists and remove for this given key, we would remove the entry for that key. Okay. But what happens if you don't know or don't care the state, the pre-existing state of the document, you really just want to say, I want to put the document into the database and I don't really care if it exists or doesn't exist. I just want it to result in the object being in Couchbase. Okay, in that case, we have a special method called upsert. Upsert basically says if the object exists already, then we'll do a replace. If the object does not exist, then we will do a insert. Either way, we don't really care what the pre-existent state of the document is. We'll just make it so that the end result is the document is stored for the given ID or the key. Okay, so that's the distinction. All right, and with that, let's actually focus on the individual operations and drill in just a little bit more detail. All right, we'll start with the get because it's a little bit the, uh, more the simplest operation. So with a given ID, I wanna perform a get, which would be expected to return to me the object I'm, I'm requesting. And so you can see that the main operation has a uh, at a minimum, you must provide the ID or the document ID or the key as we sometimes refer to it. And then we optionally have the ability to specify a get options uh, um, additional argument. Now this kind of leads us to a discussion of the notion of options and what are options in general? Well, it's really just a container for the options you might want to use to tune the operation that you're performing. So we saw or mentioned earlier when we were getting connected to the cluster that we had a cluster options object that would allow us to specify parameters or values that would tailor or tune the behavior of getting connected to the cluster. Well, in this case, we have a options class called get options that allows us to tune the things that we would want to specify during the get operation. So that gives us an optional way to specify more detail with a basic default behavior that allows you, if you don't want to specify more things, then it allows you to basically just specify the bare minimum, which is, I have an ID, I want the document for that ID, so get me the ID. Oh, and by the way, if you want to specify more things, then you can say, oh, I want to change the transcoder, or I want to uh, perform a sub-document fetch, or I want to get the expiry data returned in addition to everything else. So you can actually tailor that, that, that behavior a little bit with that. Um, the last thing I want to mention is what happens if the document does not exist? Well, you actually get a exception thrown, the base class being Couchbase exception. We're going to look at this a little bit later, but the Couchbase exception that actually gets thrown here is called document not found exception, which is the logical thing you'd expect to have happen if you didn't have find the object or the document for the ID that was specified. So in the case where the document exists, the document's returned. In the case where the document does not exist, you get an exception thrown. All right, the last piece that I want to talk about is the result object that gets returned. So this is the first of a number of examples where we're going to see a result that's kept in a container that's generically referred to as a result object. In this case, when you perform a get operation, what you get as a result is the get result. Okay, so the get result is now a container for the different things that you can do 
uh, with the result, including potentially getting timing information, including getting the object that you requested, including other things that you may want to do. And again, we'll explore more of those later as we uh, as we get further into the various different sessions. Okay, so the very simplest interaction that you may have in order to get a value or a document from the Couchbase database is to start with the bucket, get the collection using default collection. Once you have the default collection, you would perform the get, uh, get call. You would return a get result. With the get result, you would perform one of the method calls, which is called content as object. And what content as object does is it always returns a JSON object. Okay, now we're going to talk more about different ways to deal with different object types, but one of the simplest things you can do is just get the JSON object. JSON object is another uh, kind of class that's defined in the Couchbase SDK that allows you to have a generic container and interact with that container that represents the hierarchical nature of your JSON uh, document. So it's one way in which you can interact if you don't want to take the trouble of converting it into some kind of a domain object. And again, we're going to talk more about this a little bit later, but that's the basic idea. So the first example is just a very simplest example. And then the second example actually shows how you can do a little bit more by providing the get options to specify uh, additional things, which might include, hey, by the way, not only do I want the, the result of the request, the get request, but I want to get the expiry data associated with that as well. OK, so that's that one. Now, the next few we're going to look at um, more quickly because they're basically very similar. They all have the same pattern, just depending on the semantic behavior you're looking for. So obviously, in the case of an insert, the minimum you would provide on an insert is the ID of the document you're storing and the document itself that you're storing. And then optionally, you have an argument that is called insert options that would allow you to specify the things associated that might tailor or tune the behavior of the insert operation. As with the get example, you, um, you have a behavior, you have a result that's returned, you have an exception that could be thrown, and there is a corresponding assumption that exists. In this case, if you're going to do an insert, we assume that the document does not exist. Well, what happens if the document does exist? You would get an exception thrown. In this case, you would get a document exists exception that would be thrown. <clears> that <throat> Now, if you don't get a document exists exception thrown, the the result you would expect to get back is the mutation result. Now, in the case of the get, we had a get result. In the case of our mutation operations, which are the remaining three operations we're going to look at, you'll actually see that all of them return the same class, which is a mutation result. The reason for that is, is that regardless of the mutation op operation you're performing, whether it's an insert, a replace, a remove, or an upsert, basically the result you would expect to get back would be roughly the same. And so rather than having a specific result object for every operation, they're just uh, uh, collected together and the same basic common class called mutation result is used. So um, that's the one difference between the other examples that we saw. So in the first example, we see where we get the collection, we perform the insert. And then in the second example, we see um, how we can use the insert options. I've shown you a couple of different ways to do this um, insert options. So in this example, we did uh, get options where you invoke the get options dot with expiry. So get options is a um, object that you would get, and then you would perform the with expiry. In this case, um, we have the insert options where you have an insert options, and then there's a method that returns the insert options, and then you can perform various um, you know, subsequent operations on it to specify various values. There's a, a couple of different ways to do that. We've kind of used the inline approach here to just specify one thing that we want to change for the insert, which is to change the duration uh, that that object is expected to live before it's expired. OK. Similarly, we have the replace. And I'm not going to spend as much time on these because you can see that the basic pattern is roughly the same. Uh, in each case, you have the, the basic behavior, the replace in this case would have the same ID and value. But again, the semantic behavior would be we expect the document to already exist if we're going to perform a replace. So if you perform a replace operation and the document reference does not exist, you get a document not exists exception, which is a subclass of Couchbase exception. Again, we'll talk more about exceptions and exception handling in a later section. All right, moving on. The last one that we're going to talk about here in any detail is the delete. 
or remove in this case. So the method is actually called remove. The behavior, the semantic behavior is what we call a delete typically. Again, remove, you only need to specify the ID and optionally the remove options, which allows us to tailor things. Um, we'll talk more about the CAS value uh, when we get to the last section. Um, or the last uh, presentation in this series uh, where we'll talk more about production type operations. So we won't spend any time on that, but uh, we'll come back to it. But again, options allows us to specify various things, including transcoders, CAS value, um, depending on the context, um, the different operations, different things might make sense there. All right, um, so I wanna do again, a quick demo. And then we're gonna come back and talk about handling errors. And then we'll kind of walk through the, uh, the various bits of the code again. So let's uh, jump over to our IDE. And here we're going to add a, um, a basic operation, which is we're going to perform a get. And you can see in the code, we have a key that we're gonna perform a get on. Let me do a quick uh, organize imports here. Okay, so we got that in. So we're gonna perform a basic get for a key uh, whose key is playlist colon colon and then a GUID that we're gonna use that references that, that particular playlist. Um, we're going to have a get result. And then on the get result, we're going to do a content as, as object. And then with that content as object, we're gonna get a particular element of that. And then we're gonna compare it to make sure that the name in this case, the name, the value for the name element actually has the value playlist number two for Milja. Okay, so that's basically the operation. Now, what I want you to pay attention to this time is when we run, you're gonna see a bit more information show up in the output. So we assume that if everything works properly, this won't throw an assert error, so we won't get an exception, but pay attention to the output, uh, which will include more information about the bucket being opened and closed and so on. Okay, we see here that uh, Couch Music 2 is opened. So here's the open bucket. And then during the shutdown, we close the bucket and then we see the rest of the, um, we see the best rest of the shutdown process take place. So again, that highlights the fact that that operation of actually opening the bucket, even though we referenced it earlier, it's a bit lazy in that it doesn't actually bother to open it until something needs to be done on the bucket. And then at that point we would open it. There are some options to actually do that a little more aggressively but we just took the simple approach and assumed just the lazy default behavior um, makes sense there. Okay, so let's move on to the next section, handling errors. All right, so we've already talked about the fact that uh, Couchbase uh, can throw various exceptions depending on the operation you're performing. The thing I wanna point out, there's a couple of key things I want you to be aware of is number one, all of these exceptions, document not found exception, document exists, timeout exception, and many others, all derive from a base class called Couchbase exception. And Couchbase exception is what we refer to as a runtime or unchecked exception. And those of you who know Java well probably already know that what are the behavior of a runtime exception is, is that you're not required to catch the exception at the point where the exception could be thrown. But in fact, you could leave that uncaught, unprocessed. And then what happens by default is, is that that exception just propagates up and can often go all the way through the execution, execution unhandled. Now that's typically, um, there's a couple of benefits to being able to have runtime exceptions. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but one advantage is, is, is that it allows us to catch the exception in a different place than where it's thrown, which might allow us some additional flexibility in terms of um, not propagating certain exceptions or, or so on into different areas. Um, we have a bit more flexibility in kind of cr uh, keeping the scope of various things um, maintained within, you know, uh, let's say in the case of a, a data access um, kind of behavior, we would have something that might be more, more tied to Couchbase and to a repository behavior. And we wouldn't want that necessarily to propagate all the way up or force us to catch a repository or a Couchbase exception in a controller in an application or something like that. So the idea is, is that uh, we can catch it or we can catch it as a general runtime exception or we can do any number of things. So the point is you need to understand that these exceptions can get thrown and by nature, they're not gonna require you to handle that exception at the point of 
of where it's thrown, where you're typically required to either catch and rethrow or declare that your method throws that same exception and so on. So again, there's advantages and disadvantages to that, regardless of what you might think of one or the other, the point is couch base throws unchecked exceptions. And so my recommendation is actually that you catch the exception locally and translate it into something maybe more generic. So what we'll often recommend and what we recommend in the actual course is that you may have your own exception that might be called uh, you know, repository exception or some generic exception in your application. And you catch these various couch base exceptions and tra translate them into something a bit more um, data neutral that doesn't actually convey the details of the fact that it actually occurred because of couch base or something like that. So just mention that because you need to be aware of the fact that there is a hierarchy of exceptions and they all derive from couch base exception, which is a runtime or unchecked exception. So the typical pattern that we'll use then when we perform an operation is that we anticipate any exceptions. And, and you remember the chart that we showed at the beginning of the section, uh, the prior section, where we actually showed that there was assumptions or expectations associated with each operation. So for example, a get operation has an assumption that the docu document exists. Uh, conversely, an insert op operation has the assumption that the document does not exist. And so um, you need to be prepared to catch those exceptions. So a couple of things that you can do is you typically uh, will perform your operation inside of a try catch block and you can choose to either catch the core exception, the couch base exception, or you can individually catch each, each exception and handle them differently. That's totally up to you. But I would recommend that you catch the exception and then rethrow it as some sort of more generalized exception. In this case, you see that we've just rethrown it as a repository exception. That way we don't have a leaky abstraction where couch base details propagate up and get caught somewhere else. And we really don't want to have those kind of get um, get propagated outside of maybe the core behavior that would perform the what we'd call a repository or data access kind of core functionality. All right, so putting it all together, then if we went back to our uh, our application, what we typically do is probably wrap this operation in a try catch block. So we'd start here by saying try a course, and then around that we would catch a um, can't spell and then inside of this we can perform some kind of uh, some kind of a thing. There we go. Okay, so this is a typical behavior where if by chance I was to do something like this, uh, I'll just go ahead and remove one of the elements and I save it and run it. You'll see that in this case, rather than seeing a big ugly stack trace, we just have a some kind of a message. We can log it out, we can throw an exception, we can do both, that's up to you. But basically just kind of that's the pattern you wanna implement is just following that basic pattern of you know wrapping everything in a try catch block, making sure that you propagate. And good developers already know that. So I'm probably um, you know telling you something you already know. The last section I wanna focus this on is serialization, deserialization. So um, one thing that we kind of glossed over a little bit is what happens in terms of documents. You know that JSON documents typically can be rep represented a lot of different ways. We can represent a JSON document as a string. We can represent a JSON document as some kind of JSON object, um, or we could actually translate it into a domain object. And in the prior examples, we showed an example of simply using a JSON object, which we didn't spend a lot of time on. But what I wanna do now is kind of spend a bit more time drilling into the notion of what happens during serialization and deserialization.
The thing that's important to realize is, is that Couchbase is built already with a set of default serializers that are able to do um, fairly straightforward things depending on the nature of your object. So the default serializer knows how to work with JSON objects and store them properly. It also knows how to work with domain objects and translate them into their corresponding format in order to store them as well. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about what you might need to know as a developer in order in order to, to basically operate with strings uh, that might be representing JSON documents or JSON object or so on. So let's just kind of look at a couple of the different examples we have here. All right, so what happens if you, as we saw earlier, we performed a get and the get result, we could perform a content as object. Now what we have back is a JSON object. Well, that's kind of interesting, but what would you do with the JSON object? You don't really want to propagate that JSON object too far outside of your application scope uh, or specifically the scope of your repository operations because again, JSON object is a Couchbase object and you don't want to have too many leaky abstractions where you have Couchbase components being splattered throughout your application. So you want to focus on probably translating it into one of two different formats. One would be I want to convert it to a string. The other would be uh, I want to convert it into a domain object. So we're going to look at both of those examples. But here here we're showing an example of how I could take my JSON object and convert it to a string, and then I could return the string and do something with it. So you can see that JSON object has the ability to convert to string, and that would, that would just simply uh, turn it into a, a string that is formatted in JSON format. Which leads us to our second example, which is uh, the case of where I start with a string and I want to perform the corresponding or the, the reciprocal operation of inserting an object. I don't insert the string because that's actually, it's, it's kind of formatted in a funny way with lots of escape characters. And actually it turns out that we, we wouldn't recognize that as a JSON document per se, which means you wouldn't be able to take advantage of all of the kind of the goodness that Couchbase has to offer, including taking advantage of nickel queries and analytics and things like that. So we wanna make sure that we store it as a JSON object or a JSON document because then Couchbase is able to leverage all of the power uh, that's available to perform nickel queries and, and that sort of thing. So how do you do that? Well, what happens if somebody gives you a string? What happens if you have a web application and a string gets passed in that's JSON document? How do you deal with that? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can use a method on JSON object called from JSON and you pass in a string. And if it's, if it's properly formed JSON data, then it will actually parse it and turn it into its corresponding JSON object. And then with that JSON object, you can just simply store it. So that's kind of how that works. And then the last example here is, well, what happens if I want to actually convert my object into a domain object? or an entity object as we often call it. Well, it turns out that Couchbase has configured within it dependencies that are able to handle the translation. So if you actually look at the details in your SDK uh, of the dependencies that got pulled in, you'd actually see that we have the ability uh, to enable JSON conversions. And so those JSON conversions would allow us to um, uh, it, it actually leverages a library called the Jackson JSON library. And with the Jackson JSON library, we actually have the ability to convert um, basically any domain object into its JSON equivalent. It's actually pretty easy to decompose a domain object into its JSON equivalent. The challenge becomes how do you convert the the JSON data into its corresponding domain object because there, there has to be a fairly tight coupling between the JSON object you know, in its JSON representation and the domain object that it would be expected to convert into. So I wanna show you that next. Um, it's really important if you're going to design a domain object that is going to translate a, um, a JSON object and support the translation of that, you'll actually wanna pay very close attention to the structure of that document. So what you would do is you take a look at the JSON document that, that would be returned as a string format. You'd look at the various elements like ID and name and owner and created. You'd acknowledge the fact that ID is a string, name is a string, owner is some kind of a complex object. We'll come back to that. Created is a date that's formatted as a string. Tracks is what's called a JSON array, 
And then the various other elements here are fairly straightforward. JSON, remember, can also uh, store numerical values. So you might find a numerical value in here as well that you would want to pay attention to. All right, so with that in mind, we need to think about how to design the domain object that would correlate and be able to be translated from the JSON object into the domain object. So it's fairly straightforward. You just go down the list and you just define those elements by their names. That's the simplest approach. Now, Jackson JSON actually has a series of annotations that can help you sort of, if you want to have object names or, or variable names in your field names in your class, you can actually use annotations to sort of decorate the various elements and say, well, I'm calling the variable ID, but actually I want to refer to that in the JSON document as something else or vice versa. Maybe I want to, I want to call that ID um, primary key or something like that. Well, you, you could actually do that with the annotations. We're going to take a very simplistic approach here, which is define your values, provide the associated getters and setters, and then you would be able to do the conversion. Now, I want to come back to a couple of things that are going on here. One is notice that owner is a, uh, a, a JSON object of its own. In other words, it references a JSON string that is actually itself made up of various elements. Well, how does that get translated? Well, you would have to create an object that has those definitions and that object would be referenced in, as we see here for owner. So there's that capability. There's also the capability to do translations between a string and a date. So assuming the data is formatted in a, in a logical format, you can actually relatively easily translate between a string and the date, the Java date object and back and forth that way. So um, that can be pretty nice if you want to do that kind of a representation. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, we have an array in the JSON document called tracks. And that can be represented as a um, Java util list. And so we have a list of strings that would represent our tracks. And so you can see that the name correlation of the properties aligns with the name properties of the JSON document. And if you do that and you create the appropriate getters and setters and you have a standard no, um, no argument constructor, then the Jackson JSON library is perfectly able to translate back and forth. I wouldn't worry too much about getting it 100% accurate the first time as you build your application and test it. And if you have an object that you return and you use a method like we have here where we have, um, you know, collection.get and then with the result, we do a content as and pass in the type of the object. If you fail to specify one of the elements, then Couchbase would actually throw an exception. You would see um, in the details of the exception that it, it couldn't map a particular field. And then you just say to yourself, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot that I didn't specify one of the properties. You would add that property, add the appropriate getters and setter, and you'd be off and running. And so trial and error, you could actually get very quickly to the point where you have a domain object that can be translated to and from JSON to get the appropriate document. So again, keep in mind, Couchbase actually automatically will be able to translate without any extra work on your part. The code would look exactly like we see here, where we would have result.content as the definition of the class you want to convert into, and then it would return an object of that type and so on. So um, very handy mechanism if you want to actually uh, return domain objects as opposed to strings uh, in your application. All right. So that concludes our basic discussion of using the SDK. Um, I think that lays a foundation for you to be able to get started getting the project configured, getting your uh, application connected to the Couchbase database, and then performing key value operations, taking into consideration that possible errors could occur, and supporting the ability to do key, um, translations from uh, various representations using the serialization and deserialization mechanisms that are automatically part of the SDK. So that's the beauty of this whole thing is it's very simple to do. So uh, I want to draw your attention to some upcoming sessions that you'll probably want to attend. One is uh, data modeling. That'll be coming later in the day today. Um, you'll also have a couple of sessions tomorrow, the nickel querying section, which will kind of round out our application development in general. And then the last session that we'll do is called uh, ensuring your application makes it to the top. We'll talk about sub documents, optimistic locking and durability. That's also tomorrow. So stay tuned for all of those. And those would round out the discussion that's necessary to provide the foundation for you being able to uh, uh, prepare for and pass the Java 
uh, the Associate Java Developer Certification. So thanks for attending. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for following along. And we look forward to seeing you in the certification process and ultimately uh, seeing you achieve and attain your, your uh, certification.